Hey, welcome again to Discovery Church. Make some noise. Come on, if you're excited to be in God's house. Yeah. And we are in part two of a series we began last week. How many of you came to that? Did you spirit detox? How many of you were your spirit detox? Okay. Uh, so we started this detox program. For those of you that are kind of new to the, the series and you're just jumping in in part two, we started a detox program last week. I'm kind of joking, but not really, because I, I really think, man, there's, we go through seasons of life and like ups and downs and maybe emotional disturbances and stuff like that, not feeling good, feeling good. I think, I think we misdiagnose those. I think unknowingly, we actually have toxicity in us that's revealing itself. We're just not identifying it as such. So, so we're doing a series where we're intentionally looking at some different domains of our being, of our life, and trying to identify where some of the toxins, these, these contaminants of this crazy world, of this sinful, broken, fallen world, get inside of us. And I truly believe that if, if you don't have like intentional times where you are doing that, where you're like looking in and you're looking for the stuff that don't belong there and taking it out, you're inevitably going to be toxic, okay? So last week was really important. If you didn't catch that, go get it online. It's on our YouTube website. Here's, let me catch you up because there, we were created, I told you last week, we were created in the image of God. And God is triune and he made mankind triune. So we have a spirit, a soul, and a body. We have three parts of, of who we are. Each of them, they're very connected, but they're unique in their function. The spirit is the innermost part of your being that can connect with God. Okay, that's the eternal part of who you are. And that's why we started last week with that most important part of a spirit detox. Today, we're going to move into the soul and talk about how we can get a toxic soul and go through, I hope, I pray this week, a soul detox. So, so just like last week, listen, be, don't just be a listener, you know, be a doer of the word, take some notes. I believe what God's going to do is reveal to you in your life, in your heart, in your soul, where there are some of those contaminants and toxicities, what needs to be removed and how you can step out of that. And for the next six days, I'm going to challenge you to intentionally, intentionally do that so that we can go into a soul detox. Now remember, the soul, the soul part of you is the mental, the psychological, mental, and emotional part of you, okay? And I'm not sure how much attention you give to your mental health or to your emotional health, but, but that is a part of your being and yourself that the enemy can target and infect you and afflict you if you are not aware. So what does that look like to have toxic? Some of the symptoms of a toxic soul is where we have unforgiveness, bitterness, jealousy, anger, comparison, worry, discouragement. All those things are, are, are symptoms of a toxic soul, which again, just because we're toxic doesn't mean you're a bad person. Every single one of us, like every human, we're living in the same world. We have the same sinful flesh. We all will become toxic and need to remove this stuff. So I'm going to show you today, today I'm going to show you two different prophets that actually had to deal with a toxic soul. They got to a bad place in their soul. One of them was Jeremiah, a prophet of the Old Testament, he wrote Jeremiah, the book, but he also wrote this book called Lamentations, okay? And Lamentations is that. It's a lament. It's a book of just crying. He's just, he just, just always a cry. It's just a cry. He's just lamenting about his situation. Let me show you what he says in, in Lamentations chapter three. He says, I have been deprived of peace. Anyone ever feel like that? Like, man, I just feel, it's gone. I've been deprived of this. I have forgotten what prosperity is. I don't even know what healthy looks like anymore. I don't even know what a healthy family looks like, what a healthy marriage. I've been so unhealthy. We've been so unhealthy for so long. I don't even know what prosperity would even look like. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. So I'm hoping, I'm asking God, but he ain't coming through. Like, I don't think he's answering. My prayers are helping. I remember, time out right there, because this is the problem when we get toxic, you guys. We get, we get into a bad place where we're deprived of peace. We can't even remember. We, we, don't, we, don't, we start remembering the wrong things. 
So, so we should be, hey, we should be remembering the blessing of God and when he did come through and what he has said and what he has done. But here he is. Look what, look what Jeremiah is remembering. He's remembering my affliction. I remember my wandering, my bitterness, and the gall. Well, those aren't good things to be sitting around thinking about. And he says, I well remember them. Like, I've rehearsed them so much in my mind. I remember them so well to the point he says this. Look at it. And my soul is downcast within me. Well, of course it is, Jeremiah. If that's what you're sitting around thinking about, of course it's going to affect and infect your soul. So if today you're in this place where your soul feels heavy, downcast, where you feel peace has been deprived of you, if you feel like you don't even remember what healthy looks like, success looks like, a healthy life, a healthy marriage, or if you're remembering, you're caught today and you're remembering the wrong stuff, rehearsing it in your mind, you are a candidate for a soul detox, okay? And that's what we're going to do. I want to study 1 Kings chapter 19, all of it, most of that chapter, I want, I want to study a person named Elijah, another prophet of the Old Testament who was one of the most powerful prophets in all of Israel, if not the most powerful, most famous prophets in all Israel, but he struggled with what I'm calling today a toxic soul. You know, he struggled with worry and distress and depression and anger. His soul got infected, and I want us to see how it happened and how he got out of it. Okay, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. I got a lot to cover with you today. Are you ready for the word of God? Because there's a lot I'm going to give you today, okay? Okay, here it is. Here it is. Starting in verse 1. He says, now Ahab told Jezebel, these are both the king and queen of Israel. Israel at this time, you guys, was a fallen nation. They had started worshiping false gods. And they, these are evil, an evil king and an evil, wicked queen. So it says, now Ahab, King Ahab, told Queen Jezebel everything Elijah had done, that he had killed all the prophets, like the false prophets. So what he did, actually, chapter 18, Elijah had a standoff against 850 false prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth, and he, and he put them to death by the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. Notice with me, she didn't send someone to kill him. She sent someone with a message, a threat, to kill him, okay? So this would have been like, she sent a text message, you know what I mean? She sent, she sent an I am to, to, to Elijah. On his, he, got, he got a text or a comment on his Instagram page. Look what it said. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them you killed. That was the I am he got that day, okay? Elijah, it freaked him out. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba, now that might not be an important place to you, but if you read 1 Kings, that was the place that, that Elijah first made his oath to God. It was the place of his oath. It was the place of commitment. It was the place where he said, I'm all in, God. I'm yours. And so he goes back to that place that he made his original oath to God, and he said, God, I don't think I could do this. This is what I signed up for. God, you were supposed to protect me. I wasn't supposed to go through this, God. I don't think I can do this. This ain't going to work out. And he leaves his servant there. Big mistake. While he himself went ahead on a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, which is, it's a low-hanging tree. And he sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. And he prayed something that every one of us have probably prayed, or whether out loud, said out loud, or thought in our heart. He said, I have had what? had enough you ever said that have you ever i've had it come on you parents you know you've said i've had it i've had it so so here he is he said he, i've had enough how do you get to this place man how do if, if today you're you're there if you're you're close to there you feel like i've had enough man i'm tired of this i mean you're a candidate today for a soul detox he's he go, he goes on look what he says he says take my life I don't even want to do this living anymore. I've had it. I'm no better than my ancestors. We're going to see clearly in this story here, these first four verses, six soul toxins. How did, how did, how did, how did Elijah get to this place? 
How do, how do he get to this place where just, just a while ago he was on top of the world? How do we get to a place where we're ready to turn our back on the very oaths that we made, the commitments that we made? A month ago we were fine, but now we're ready to call it quits. I want out of the marriage. I don't want to go to church no more. I don't want to serve God no more. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not. How did it happen? What happened to our soul that we would be so afflicted and switch? What, what happened? What got inside, Elijah? What gets inside of us that poisons us to the point that we want to throw it away? We want to give in. I think there's some factors that we have control over. Six soul toxins we're going to learn, and then we're going to learn also five ways that Elijah got out of it, five ways to go through a soul detox. And all of this is going to be from this scripture right here, this chapter, 1 Kings chapter 19. Y'all ready for it? Okay, here we go. Okay, what are the soul toxins then? Happen to Elijah, it can happen to us. It can get inside of you. Write it down. Here's the first one. Life imbalances. Where your life is out of order, man. It's running out of pace. You're, you're over schedule. You're too busy. You're just imbalancing your life. I like what this author, I was reading Johan Hari in his book. He wrote a book called Lost Connections. And he said something that was so profound. I wanted to share it with you guys. He said, we need to stop talking as much about chemical imbalances and start talking more about the imbalances in the way we live. Now, chemical imbalances is a reality, and there is a real need to sometimes medicate that, get counseling for that, and I get it. There is that. That's a reality, and that can actually be part of God's solution for people. I absolutely understand that, but I'm also of the persuasion and the perspective that we need to stop focusing as much on chemical imbalances and more on the imbalance of your life that is affecting your soul. More and more research is showing, it's pointing that, that our, to our lifestyles are the primary reason why we do not have inner health. That our lifestyle is the reason for the depression. It's not, it's not always the chemical. It's the lifestyle. So in 1 Kings, let me show you how it, it happened to Elijah. In, in the previous chapter, in chapter 18, I told you Elijah had a standoff with these false prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth. 850 of them against one Elijah. It was awesome, man. Elijah, he gets this altar, and he puts the sacrifice on it. And not only does he do that, but he drenches it with water, like covers it with water, okay? And then he calls down the fire of God from heaven. To consu- and it consumed not only the sacrifice, but it lapped up and dried up all the water, okay? And, and then he, he puts all the 850, he, kill- he puts them to death by the sword. It was gangster, man. It was just aw- He just, it was so cool. And then right after that, still in chapter 18, uh, Israel has, has been through at that time a three-year drought. It's affecting the entire land, crops and all that. Like there's starvation, there's, it's, it's bad, it's bad. Elijah, three-year drought. He declares rain from heaven and rain starts to fall, okay? So you would think after these two amazing victories that that he'd be ready to throw a party. It's time to celebrate. But that's not what happened. He got to his lowest point. Here's what I have found. It's after your greatest victories that your soul is more susceptible to the enemy's attack. It's your greatest. It's after those high moments that you are more open. For me, it's Sunday night. Sunday night is like, it's, it's, it's after the moment of high salvations and baptisms and Easter and great stuff God is doing. If I'm not careful on a Sunday night, man, I'll start thinking about the wrong stuff. Like, oh, you should have said that. You didn't do this. Well, how come you? And who was? Why weren't they there? And what's going on with them? And that should have happened. And that didn't happen. So I've learned over the years of doing ministry, I got to protect my mind on Sunday night. I just cannot listen to everybody. I cannot talk to everybody. I cannot read everything. I need to make sure I'm hearing the right stories from the right people. I'm going to make sure that I'm protecting my heart and my mind from these, from these negative things, man. I, I went skiing earlier this year, and I haven't been skiing in like 20 years, you guys. And so I was a little bit, it was in North Lake Tahoe, and then that snow fell, that, that, that huge snowstorm. It was amazing, man. And, but I was a little afraid because I'm like, but I got on there, I was like riding a bike. And I was like, ah, ah, ah. So I went down this, the small hill. And I was like, okay, this is, this is come back. So you know me, man. I'm up three lifts. I'm going to the top, man. Take me to the, take me to the top. I'm going down the big mountain. And so I, I start going up there. And the, I see the, uh, the, like the paramedic, the ski paramedic guy. I'm like, I'm going to talk to this dude, though. Let me get some advice. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, it's busy, man. It's a beautiful day. Are you guys, are you guys busy? <laughs> and, and he's like, he's like, no, it's cool right now. He said, he said this, check this. He said, 90% of all our injuries come at the, at the last hour of the day. 
So here's two things happened in the last hour, right? Number one is you're very tired. But number two, you're at your most comfortable and complacent. You're, you're at this place where you're like, I got this. Yeah, I know how to, I got, to, I got it back. You know, you get so comfortable. I think we get to this place where we're so arrogant, right? Where we're, we're, we think, I can do this, but not everything that's doable is sustainable. I'm going to say that word again for some of you. Not everything that is doable is sustainable. We create paces that we can't continue, and your soul is going to catch up to you. Okay? Stephen Alardi is a, a psychologist. He wrote this. He said, we were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food-laden, sleep-deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. We weren't. We weren't designed for this. So what do we do? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6 says, Better one handful in tranquility, the peace of God, peace of heart, peace of mind, peace in my home. Better one. Some of you guys are like, but I got two hands. Come on, man. Let me grab. No, 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 no. Better, better one job than two jobs and no peace in your home or your marriage. No peace in your children. Okay. Better, I mean, I know I, can, I know I can afford to get it all, but I'm not going to get it all. I'm just going to get better one handful. Come on, am I talking to you guys? Are you receiving this? Okay. Now, this is countercultural because we live in a culture that says if one is good, two is, yeah, you know it, right? Come on, if one dollar is good, two dollars is, hey, hey, shoot, shoot, shoot. if one donut is good, then two donuts are, is better. If one wife is good, then two wives are trouble. Don't you dare. Don't you stop it. Stop it. That's... That's not better. I'm just seeing if you guys are awake here, okay? Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. That's what happened with Elijah. Elijah just kept going and going. Oh, he's a man of God. He can take it. But he got, his soul came to the end of himself. A te- that's all he got was a text message. That's all it took, okay? And the second thing, Elijah, remember, he said, I'm no better than my ancestors. And this is... This is the, 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 a soul toxin that can get inside of you, comparing ourselves with others. Compare, I'm t- one of the primary reasons why some of our souls are toxic today is because of social media, what I, or what I like to call anti-social media, because there ain't nothing social about it. We've replaced social relationships with digital relationships. And I just think, you guys, you don't need to know it all. You don't need to know what they're cooking for dinner. You don't need to know what kind of shoes they bought. You don't need to know what vacation they went on. You just don't need to know all that stuff. Comparison is the thief of joy. And the more you're sitting there wondering and investigating what they're doing with what they got, the more your peace is going to get robbed from you. The more the peace that God wants to get get into you will be elusive, like Jeremiah said. Where is it? Okay, the Bible says that, that we're to live completely different than the rhythm of this culture. Look what it says here in Galatians chapter 6. I think I already did comparing ourselves. Did you put it up there already? Yeah, I had already. Yeah, there you go. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6 now. Galatians chapter 6. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can, look what it says, take pride in themselves alone now this is the good kind of pride not the bad pride not the puffed up pride this is a pride that is not because i'm comparing myself it's in myself alone it's where you go thank god look what he thank god i'm not where i used to be look what god has done i know i'm not yet where i want to be but god i am so grateful then it says you can take pride in yourself without comparing yourself to anybody else for each one will should carry their own load so Elijah was never going to stand before God on behalf of his ancestors. He didn't need to go there and comparing himself. He was going to stand before God on behalf of his own calling. And I'm just, I'm just saying, what if, you guys, what if we're just noticing too much about other people's lives? What if we're looking too much at other people's lives? And all the research is showing this, you guys, that are online, social media viewing addiction. Listen to me. It's reprogramming and structuring our brain. Like the the structure of your brain is changing. The human brain is changing 
how we think and what that brain does and how it releases what it's supposed to release to your body when it's supposed to release is changing so much to the point that content creators are coming out now apologizing to society and they don't even let their kids get on social media i don't some of you guys don't know this you may be upset at this but i was i started fasting social media at, at the end of last year and so if you if you're commenting on my stuff and stuff i'm sorry i ain't seen it I got a social media team that's taking care of it. Like I help them because I want to, po I want to give encouragement to your life. And, and I, so I want to do that, but I don't just want to be caught like this. You know what I mean? Just, just scrolling. I don't want to, I just, at the end of last year, the Lord told me, consecrate yourself. Focus, focus. And so I started, I intentionally started to remove some things from my life so that I, 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 I knew that what God would want, wanted to do in me and through me this year, I need to be more in God's presence. I need to be more in God's word so I can give you the best of me. Is that okay, you guys, if I actually, if I just get more of God's presence so I can come to you and give So I'm just saying, like, after four months, I got four months of data now, okay? I'm telling you, I, I got the peace of God. I got peace of mind, okay? There's, there's some soul toxins. Life imbalances, comparison. Here's another one. Number three, ruminating and self-talk. That's what Elijah got into. He got stuck in this. Look what it says in, in verse 9 and 10. It says, there he went into a cave, like a literal cave. Some of you, like, you get into a metaphorical cave. He went to a literal cave. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? I've, call, I have, I've called you to be out there. What are you doing over here in this cave? And he replied, I've been very, look what he says, I've been zealous, God. I've been doing all the right things. I've been reading your word, being good, going to church. I've been doing that, like, I've been, God, but these Israelites, they've rejected your covenant, torn down your altars. They put your prophets to death with the sword. Look what he says now, check this out. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Now, that wasn't true. He wasn't the only one left. And are you ready for this? Elijah knew that wasn't true. He talked himself into believing a lie. And it wasn't the first lie he believed, was it? The first lie he believed was the lie Jezebel told him. The first lie he believed sounded like this. I'm going to die. She's going to kill me. And this is what happens when deception gets inside of you. When you receive the lie of the enemy, lies beget lies. And some of you are, you're in a place where your soul is downcast. You, you have, you, your soul is toxic because you've allowed yourself, you've, you've, you've ruminated so much, you're believing falsehood. Now, things are not even true. Listen to me, I'm not even talking about God's truth. I'm just talking about things that you knew were not true a month from now. You've convinced yourself they are realities and they are not. How does that happen? How do we get to that place where we're just believing falsehood? How did Elijah get to a place where he just he knew it wasn't true but now he's a it's through ruminating you know what ruminating is ruminating is where you take your distress and then you process it in your mind over and over and over and over and every time you do how I many you know it doesn't get better it gets worse every time ruminating you know what a ruminating animal is a ruminating animal chews the cud that's that's what it means to ruminate you, you they take the cud into their mouth they chew it they swallow it down into their stomach, and then they throw it back up in their mouth, and they start chewing it again. And they swallow it back down into their, into their stomach, and they regurgitate it again, and they start, that's what it means to ruminate. How many of you know, it, it isn't better when it comes back up, and neither are your thoughts. And see, that's where the enemy wants you. The enemy wants you in that process of ruminating, bringing it back up. Bringing it back up, because every, every time you bring it back up, listen to me, it compounds the lie. Every time, it compounds. And, and now it began as, oh, she's going to kill me. Now you're, you, you're, you follow that lie so far down every time you brought it up. You, the enemy wants you doing this because the battlefield's in your mind. And that's why 2 Corinthians tells us, take captive every thought and bring it into the obedience of Christ. Remember Philippians chapter 4, I told you it last week, you guys, verse 8 and 9. It says to focus on these things, to think on these things, things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. 
think on these things. Notice Netflix isn't in the list. Come on, control your thoughts and you will control your life. The, the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace, but the mind controlled by the flesh is death. And Elijah is in a dark place here because he's ruminating on falsehood, okay? So this is just how we can get there, how Elijah got there, how maybe you got there today, where, why you're at, where you're at. Here's the fourth soul toxin, and that's the inability to process pain in a healthy way. So Elijah was going through it. Sure he was, man. He's getting this threat from this person. Someone wants to kill him, and that don't feel, man, that sucks. It's, it's to, to have someone like against you talking about you behind your back working literally against you it, it, it doesn't that's that's terrible i get it and every one of us are going to go through days like that we're just going to have bad days but there are a lot of people maybe here in this room even that you've convinced yourself that that earth owes you something and god owes you something like the promise of happiness or something like that. But what people don't realize, that God's mission was a rescue mission to get you out of the crazy dysfunctional earth and into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus actually made a promise. He said, I, he said, I promise you, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Come on, some of you love to proclaim the promises of God. There's one promise you can proclaim right there. I know that's not your refrigerator verse, but it is a promise. Some of you are like, come on, pastor, be positive. I'm positive. You are going to go through tribulation, okay? But here's what he says next. Jesus says, but take heart because I've overcome the world. So the goal wasn't to make your earth better, to remove all the tribulation from earth. No, no, that wasn't the goal. The goal was to give you an anchor for your soul that even though tribulation and the waters are troubled around you, you are not affected but stable and unwavering because of it. Okay, that was, that was the plan of God. So we're experiencing pain. Thank God for the provision, right? The provision of favor and peace and, and blessing. But we're experiencing pain. We do. The question is, what do we do when we experience it? Elijah just, he responded to the pain. And sometimes we respond to the pain the wrong way. Okay, more and more people are turning to drugs, alcohol, TV binging. Come on, gaming until 3 a.m., where are you at? Where are you at? All kind, of, all kind of variety of things, right? Why do we do it? Why, 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 do, why do we do it? Because it provides an escape. That's why we do it, right? But it's not working. We know it's not working, you guys. It's actually, that's, that's the philosophy of Sigmund Freud. You know what Freud's philosophy was? Freud was like the, the founder of psychoanalysis. And he said, the goal of life is pleasure. What do you say? That's what people believed for a while. That's the goal of life, pleasure. There is no modern psychologist or psychoanalyst that believes that today. They actually believe more in line with what God has always said. So they say the goal of life is not pleasure, it's purpose. It's meaning. Listen to me. And when you don't have purpose, you will try to get your life full of pleasure only to find out that the pleasure cannot fill you. Okay, so what do we do with the pain? Hey, we're all going to experience it. But, but when it does have, because when it's good, you're good. But when it's not good, you're toxic. Why? How do we handle this, you guys? How do we handle this? Because the world ain't changing. It's actually going to get worse. You got to learn how to handle the pain. You got to process the pain in a healthy way. Well, this is what God says. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says, God actually wants to be a part of your pain processing. Here's what it says. God wants to comfort us. He actually wants you to bring that pain and that tribulation. God comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Look what he says. If we are distressed, it's not for nothing. It is for your comfort and salvation. So listen to me, listen. There is purpose in your pain. You, th you thought your pain, you thought your experiences disqualified you? No way. In fact, those experiences that you thought disqualify you, those are the ones that actually qualify you to comfort somebody else going through the same thing. Okay, so how does God tell us to process our pain with him? And has, he uses us to be comfort to other people. These are just, okay, these are the soul toxins. Here's number five. Number five, are you guys getting something out of this? Is God revealing some things? The fifth soul toxin we can see in this story is isolation and loneliness. Isolation. Elijah left his servant there. Worst mistake he could make. I need to focus on me. 
You know, I just need, I just need to back away. I need to back away from this. Back away from that. I need, I need to focus on me. You know, they say now, they're saying that we're the loneliest society in all of human history. Isn't that crazy? With all the social connections that we're supposed to have, that we still are the loneliest people. We could be in a crowd like this, yet still feel completely alone and isolated. Remember, the, the first problem in the Bible wasn't sin, it was solitude. Okay, so the first thing that went wrong in the Bible wasn't the devil. He didn't show up till Genesis chapter 3. The first thing that re- went wrong was in Genesis chapter 2 when God says, it is not good that man should be alone. This is, this, so you are not designed to live in ice. And the very, in the moment you need when your soul is down and you can't find the peace and you're remembering all the wrong stuff, it's in that moment that we don't want to connect and open up and be vulnerable and go to the group or come to church, but it's in that moment you need them the most. It's in that moment. You are not meant to process this stuff in isolation and loneliness. Romans 12, 5 says, since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other. And then he says that each of us, look at it, needs. Hey, yeah, no, I need you. You need me. You need them. You need, we need each other. There are some things that can get in you, that can get on you. And you ain't going to get out by yourself. Can I tell you, you're, you're not going to get out by the Holy Spirit. There's some things that need, need your brothers, that need your sisters, that need, you need to get around the right, some of you, you, you're just not around the right people. And isolation and loneliness is causing some soul talks. And then the last one, number six, is spiritual warfare. I'm going to do a whole series on spiritual warfare in August. I think this is an important topic. I think it's extremely important, you guys. It's uh, uh, very misunderstood. I think there's a lot of it's a lot of weird stuff out there too, man. People just like, like don't know what to believe about it. <laughs> Let me just say, people, people want to cast out a demon when God wants to develop character. Okay? So are demons real? Absolutely, they're real. Do we wage war? Absolutely, there's a, there's a battle. I just don't think that, that the way that we're fighting this battle may not be the way you think you have to fight this battle. And I know it's like, oh, it's a couple months away. Some of you are like, come on, Basil, let's go there. I believe God actually wants to do some work to help us get there. Because go, we're going to go deep. You guys. It's going to be a deep thing. And I think God needs to actually prepare you for where we're going and what he wants to say. Because spiritual warfare is real. And guess what? It's happening right now. It's happening. Like, what if I were to tell you, check this out. What if I were to tell you that someone stole the keys to your house? Like, they got it right now. And it's, a, it's an evil, bad, wicked awful person has the keys to your house and then what if i told you and he's coming tonight hey the moment you go to sleep he's coming and everything that you love everything that's most important to you he's taking it you got kids he's gonna gag and duct tape and take your kids out from under you the moment that you go to sleep he's coming what 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 would you what would you do if you knew that was the reality i'll tell you what you i'd answer it for you you ain't going to sleep you stay up wouldn't you you probably introduced him to Smith and Wesson too. <laughs> but the Bible says, listen, the Bible says some of you are asleep. So, some of us are, are asleep and we need to wake up. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 says, be self-controlled and alert. Like we need to wake up because your enemy, you got an enemy, and it's the devil. And it doesn't, if you not believing in him doesn't make him go away. You being ignorant or ignoring doesn't make it not happen. You have an enemy. In fact, you ignoring it or not addressing this. I don't just like this part of the Bible, this part of spiritual. I just don't understand that part. You you handling it that way is a sure sign that there are footholds, strongholds, and deceptions and toxins in your life that you don't know. Because the, the, the devil is real, and he's, he's, it says he's prowling around like a roaring lion. You know what a, a lion, a lion doesn't, the lion don't come out to the zebras and be like, hey, dinner's in two hours, guys, two hours. No, no, he, right, he lies in cover, he hides. In fact, his mane, his fur is the same color as the native grass that they're from. He's lying like in plain sight, blending in, right, ready to devour someone. And then it says this, here's what you are called to do. Not act like he ain't there. Not not know about it, ignore it, or be ignorant about it. You're called to resist him. 
And if you ain't resisting him, his act, he's active in your life. Re- resist him standing firm in the faith. Ephesians 6 says it like this, put on the full armor of God. So God has given you weapons of warfare. God has given you authority. You're just not using it. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. See, there's a stance. There is a posture. There is a position you need to start taking against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. But you got to wait till August, and I'll tell you more about that. <laughs> against the devil's schemes, man. It's just, I'm just telling you, that's a, you, gotta, you need to know this. You need to study your word. You need to be equipped. You need to put on the armor of God. So that's how, okay, that's how we get into uh, the toxins that's how elijah got his soul toxic but how do you get out of it man how do we get out of this this toxic how do we go through a soul detox i told you i got so much content to you today i'm already this is usually the time i'm starting praying it down i'm giving you two sermons you're all ready for the second one okay here it is here it is here's the soul detox now let's continue reading uh chapter nine verse five then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep And all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. Come on, that's a good word right there. Some of y'all are going to leave right now. You're going to leave. That's the only thing you're saying. He said, get up and eat. Let's go, baby. (laughs) He he looked around, and there by his head was some some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he laid down again. And the angel Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and strengthened by that food. And I would add strengthened by that rest, that sleep he had. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, which was, it's, that's Mount, another name for Mount Sinai, which in the Old Testament, that's where on the top of that mountain, that was the dwelling place of God, the mountain of God. See, when the angel visited him, he didn't, for, he didn't address first his soul needs, his spiritual needs. The first thing the angel addressed was his physical needs. So I got five steps for you today. If, you, if, if today any of those symptoms, you know, landed, if the Holy Spirit was revealing things to you, I got five steps for you that Elijah took that you need to get out of that dark place, get out of that soul toxicity, okay? And the first one isn't probably what you would think, but I think it's important. It was intentional that the angel did this. Here's number one. You need to step into a needed recovery. And I'm talking about a physical recovery, a physical recovery of the soul. You need to get healthy, okay? I had this, this, I knew this guy who his kidneys started failing him and he had to get on dialysis. And, and so he had to get on that. They did all these tests on him and they put him on the, the kidney transplant list. And sometimes it takes a long time to get, the, to get a kidney. But it was about two years later, he got the phone call. They said, we got a kidney for you. And when you get that call, it's quick. They move you in really quick. They got him into the clinic. They're like, then they're running all these tests on him. They're testing his lung, testing his blood, testing his, testing everything. They're running. The, they're, they're, they're even asking, they ask his name like three, four times. This your name? This your name? They're just testing it all. In the middle of all that test, the doctor comes in looking at him. He says, oh, we can't do this procedure. And he's like, why? What, we waited two years for this. And he said, you're not healthy enough to get healthy. He said, I I can't put this solution that we have for you because your unhealthy body will reject the healthy solution. And and, and I just was wondering how many times that God wants to do something in us. Like maybe you heard the sermon, you went to the counselor, you got the advice, you know the solution, you were just too unhealthy to receive it. For a lot of us, the solution is right in front of you. Like, it's right there. You already know it. In fact, for some of you, you've already tried to apply it. You got the revelation. You got the insight. You got the counsel. You got the word and the promise. You already tried to apply it, and it didn't work. But it didn't work because there wasn't the problem with the promise. And it didn't work because there was a problem with the revelation. It didn't work because you're unhealthy and you reject, your unhealthy self rejected the healthy promise of God. Are you hearing me, you guys? So the first thing we need to do is actually... We need to get healthy enough to get healthy. That's what he was doing. That's what the angel, take a nap, get something to eat. Take another nap, get something to eat. Come on, doesn't that sound good right now? I mean, like, that sounds like a fantastic day right now. It sounds awesome. So what do we do? We got to get our lives back in order. That's what he's saying. We got to start taking control of what we can control, our rhythm, our, our, our health, our, our bodies, our time. 
Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. Man, I hope that your Sunday, I hope your Sunday isn't, isn't your catch-up day. I hope you got a day where you can take a needed recovery. I, like if you, like this should be a day, you go nap and get a good healthy meal. If you haven't done that, I hope you do that. I hope you go get a good meal and you take a, you take a good nap or a good night's rest, okay? In fact, I'm prescribing that, a good night's rest and a healthy meal in Jesus' name, okay? Notice I said a healthy meal, okay? <laughs> Some of y'all, you want to go eat that junk and then, act, no, 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 that's actually a- adding to your unhealthy body, rejecting the healthy solution of God, okay? You know, I didn't, the angel didn't come and give him Pepsi and fried chicken. He came and gave him water and bread, okay? <laughs> Some of that soul food is not good for your soul, okay? So just be careful. That's step one. Step, step one, if you, want, if you want to get out of this thing, dude, we got we to gotta step into a needed recovery. And then it, he, he continues, uh, verse 9. There he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. People get, they, they ask me all the time, how do I hear God's voice? How do I, you say you hear from God. I hear other people say they hear from God. How do I hear from God? It's going to show you in the text. Look what it says. Again, he goes, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, well, I've been very zealous for the Lord. And all these, you reject, the people reject your coming, and they turn on your altar, and they put everybody dead. Now they're going to kill me, too. Do you just, I'm reading that into it. He's like, well, and the Lord tells him, the Lord tells him, he didn't even answer that. He just goes, look, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. You need to take a step towards the presence of God, for the Lord is about to pass by. You know the greatest prescription for, for your soul is the manifest presence of God. That's where you get in the place, and God shows up in a real tangible way where you say, I met with God. Okay, because next, watch what happens next. Then a great and powerful wind tore through the mountains, tore it apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But God wasn't in that, 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 that wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, a big earthquake, but, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire came from heaven, but God wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. So here's... If you want to step out of that soul, you want to get into a soul detox, number two, step into a God encounter, okay? You need to get into the manifest presence of God, and it's not as hard as you would think. Please hear me, hear me. It's, we look for the spectacular, but God is in the intimate. That's what he was showing Elijah, who was a spectacular prophet, fire from heaven, rain from heaven, all the spectacular. He says, Elijah, slow, slow down. Listen to the gentle whisper. That's why Psalm 46 says, Be still. Quiet your soul, and then you'll know the manifest presence of God, the stillness and the quiet and the simplicity of worship. Just the other day, I I got distressed. I wasn't depressed, but I got distressed, man. There was a situation that was out of my control that was irritating me, frustrating me. I woke up in a bad mood. Anyone ever wake up in a bad mood? You're thinking about it. I woke up in a bad mood, and I got a rhythm Every morning, I'm getting into God's word, I'm getting into prayer, I'm getting into worship, then I work out. And I just got this rhythm, man. I got a routine. And it's, but when I wake up like that, it's hard to pray the way I should pray. I'm like, you see your boy, God, come on. Like, ugh. But I know, I know after years of serving God, I know that when I get like that, I need the manifest presence of God. And so I have, I have playlists that I've created. I got playlists for, for like warfare. I got playlists for praise and excitement. I got playlists for intimate worship. And I put on my worship, man. And I just, I didn't even say the words. I just sat in my office and I lifted my hands like this. And I'm just like, okay, God. And it wasn't but two minutes in the presence of God that I felt the stillness. And it was the manifest presence came into my room, man. I'm, I'm telling you, it, it just quieted my soul. I needed to step into, I could have been mad a whole day, just grumpy, though, but I stepped into a God encounter. Psalm 73, verse 16. This is a psalm of Asaph. Asaph was basically the Brennan Lamar of King David. He was Pastor Brennan. He's the worship pastor of, of King David. And he writes Psalm 73, and the first 15 verses is just 
complaining. And he's like, oh, this world, all oh, this sin, all oh, the wicked people. And then, he, and then he says in verse 16, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Look what he said. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Until I got into God's presence. That was a changing moment. The changing moment we all need. We need to step into a needed recovery. We need to step into a God encounter. And then it doesn't end there. Verse 13. When Elijah heard it, he pulled a cloak. Look at this. He, heard, he hears a gentle whisper of God. And then he covers his face. What an odd response, right? This, your face is like, that's how people identify you. He covers after he hears his voice. And he went and stood at the mouth of the cave. And the voice said to him, again, what are you doing here? Elijah, this, is, this, ain't, this ain't you. And then he replies the same thing. I've been sailing. And these Israelites have rejected and they tore down your altars. And they put your brothers in death. And I'm the only one left. And now they're going to kill me too. And what we're seeing here is someone who's lost their confidence. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing someone who, who lost their confidence actually back when Jezebel first threatened them. And people will say things to you that if you're not careful, if you receive it, will pollute your soul. But just because they believe it doesn't mean you have to believe it. And just because they had that expectation of you doesn't mean that God had that expectation of you. And you bought into an identity and a narrative that was, it's not what God says about you, which is why if you're going to soul detox, you need to, number three, you need to step into your true identity. Step into your true identity of what God says about you. You need to know what he says. I love what Eleanor Roosevelt says. She said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Man, you need to reject the lies of the enemy of what they said and what the world is saying, and you need to get back to who God says you are because you're believing some things that are false, some things about you, some things about your life that are not what God says. Step into your identity. Look what he says in verse 15. The Lord doesn't answer any complaints, but he says this. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Remember the way he came in Beersheba? God said, go back to where you made that oath. Go back to where you committed me. You gave it to me. Go back to that place and re-up. Recommit your life to me, Elijah. And when you get there, he says, anoint all these people. All you, anoint Haziel and Jehu and Elisha and all these, all these people. Very. Let me, let me skip down to the end. He says, I, actually, you're not the only one. I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. He said, you're a man of God. Get back to work. That's part of your reco recovery. If you want to um, a, a soul detox, the fourth step is this. Step into a new assignment. Some of you need to step into the assignment that God gave you that you're not doing. You ran to the cave. But God has an assignment for you, and you know it. You know, the, the psychologists today, they say, they, they say um, the, the, the healthiest thing that a person can have is a project. Meaning, if you, if you wake up and you pick your head up off the p pillow, and all you have to do is pay bills every day, pay bills, you're going to get toxic. But if you wake up every day, you lift your head off that pillow, and you know you're living for something greater than yourself, and your life is making a difference, that's a different story. Viktor Frankl said it like this, people have enough to live by, but nothing to live, to live for. They, they have the means, but no meaning. So what do we do? We got to go back the way we came. Some of you need to go back to the assignment of God, that he, the one that you accepted, the one that you took. Some of you need to accept that assignment of God to get out of your toxic situation, to get the toxin out of your soul. That was Paul's secret as well. Remember, Paul was like shipwrecked and beaten, and he got stoned and poisoned, and so, his life was so like they, this dude, he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, therefore... We do not lose heart. Wow. Paul, like you've been, Paul, how did you do? How do you get to that place? God, tell us how. He says, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day day i gotta have this day by day i'm renewing some things i'm removing some things i'm recommitting some things i'm being renewed day by day he says for our light and momentary troubles they're doing something they're achieving it's producing something it's not it's not destroying me it's developing me 
My light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul's saying, what he's saying here is, I have something bigger in my life than my problems. Yeah. So do you have problems? Yes, you have problems. Yes, I have problems. But your problems aren't the problem. Your problem is you don't have anything bigger than your problem in your life. So what do we do? He says, you got to fix your eyes. You're looking at the wrong thing. You're so fixated on the problem. You're so fixated. You're remembering the wrong stuff, chewing it down and bringing it up and over and over. And you need to fix your eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. The promise of God is before you. The breakthrough is ahead of you. The healing is ahead of you. Restoration is ahead of you. Come on, somebody. I got I to gotta see something that is not, I'm not getting caught up right here. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Which is why we always encourage you here at Discovery Church to go through the Discovery Track. Because we want you to connect to your purpose, to discover your gifting and your design and your purpose so that you can make a difference with your life. That you can understand you got an assignment from God. You didn't get the game, man. And you'll never truly be healthy until you take up the assignment that God has given you. And by the way, the assignment that God has given you, you're not supposed to do it alone. It's not supposed to be done in isolation. Okay, you weren't meant for that. Look what it says. We're going to conclude in just, just a minute. Thank you for letting me get it all out at 630. I appreciate it. You guys sitting so patiently. Okay, here's what he says in verse 19. So Elisha went from there and found Elisha. He found somebody. He left left somebody and went into the cave, right? But now he's coming out. He's stepping out. He's taking some steps to get healthy, and he found somebody. He found a brother, the son of Shaphat. He was plowing 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was was driving the twelve. And Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him, which was a sign of, of apprenticeship, a beginning, a relationship. So if you, if you want a soul detox, and I pray you're an active listener this week, and God is revealing, and you're writing this, okay, this week, for the next six days, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some stuff out, put some stuff in. Here's the fifth one. you got to step into relational strength. Relational strength. Strength, like intentional relationship. God defined, designed, men of God, he's called. You need to step into some relationships that God has destined for you. Because you weren't meant to do it alone. And you can't get out of that cave alone. You can't do it by yourself. Let me close with this. Psalm 42, verse 4. And then we're going to pray. David said, Why? And some of you are right here. Some of, the, this, some of you, these symptoms, a lot of these symptoms, you can relate to it. And here's another one. David says, why, my soul, are you so down? Right? You're, why am I so down? Why, am I, why can't I just get, why can't I be happy? Why am I so disturbed? I don't want to act like that. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be short-tempered. I don't want to be short-fused. Why? Now, remember, your soul is where your, it's your mental and emotional, it's where your thoughts are and your feelings are. That's the soul. Listen to me. You don't have to follow every thought. You don't have to follow every feeling. There is a deeper part of you. There is a spirit part. There is a spirit inside of you that has been awakened and regenerated by the spirit of the living God that has power and authority over your thoughts and over your feeling that David knew it and he said soul I'm not going to listen to your disturbance I'm not going to listen to your depression I'm not going to listen to your anger put soul put your hope in God you better yet praise him some of you you, you You've, you've stepped into some toxins, man, but you need to step. You, you stepped into the dark, and you need to step into the light. You need to take some steps, and I'd love to help you do that. 
Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.